Since 2011, the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, has been operating a database for which each authorized state provides a cryptographic key, which is the ICAO Public Key Directory, that's PKD. With the keys in this database, forged electronic passports can be easily detected. Speaking on the theme, Transforming an Economy Through Digitalization, the Ghana Story, at a lecture in Accra, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Balmia said the country is working with the International Civil Aviation Authority organization to globally activate the e-passport function of the Ghana card. With the Ghana card, the identity of people, even dead people, can be established using their fingerprints. Ghanaian and other embassies abroad will be able to establish the identity of Ghanaians using fingerprints. Identity can be established even without the Ghana card. As long as you are enrolled in the database and you, you put your fingers on the application, you can be uh, verified. That the Ghana card is also an e-passport that contains biometric information that can be used to authenticate the identity of travelers. The government, since this year, has been working with the International Civil Aviation Authority organization, ICAO, to globally activate the e-passport function of the Ghana card. I am happy to announce that on 13th October this year, the Ghana officially became the 79th in member of the International Civil Aviation Organization Public Key Directory com Community. Ghana's country signing certificate authority would therefore soon be imported into the PKD system through what is known as a key ceremony. After Ghana fulfilled all the strict requirements to make it to the list, the ICAO included the country's key in their PKD in mid-October. Dr. Baumia added that ICAO will, in a ceremony, outdoor the country's inclusion before March next year. The key ceremony for Ghana will be held at ICAO headquarters in Montreal before the end of the first quarter of 2022. Ghana is currently going through an unprecedented digital transformation under the leadership of the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. Various stakeholders have highlighted the need for partnership with other key stakeholders, especially in the private sector, to help drive the digitalization agenda. In his address at the Stan Chartered Digital Banking Innovation and Fintech Festival, Dr. Baumia challenged stakeholders in the fintech ecosystem to continue to innovate and compete whilst cooperating with each other. Fundamentally, there is no inconsistency between competition and collaboration. I know that many of the stakeholders in our ecosystem, in the private sector, are very profit-driven. 
Um, the central bank it, the, ha, has to guard jealously the safety and stability of the system and strive to get financial inclusion. And the central bank has been driving this, as the governor said, for many, many years. But if we don't collaborate, as we are saying, then everybody would be in silos. But once we come together in one ecosystem, then we are able to derive economies of scale from that collaboration, where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Along the same line, he further asked these stakeholders to effectively collaborate in pushing for the growth of the Universal KR Code to help government achieve its cash light agenda. When you look at the way mobile money interoperability was executed, we've got everybody in this ecosystem on the same platform. Before, you had everybody working in different silos. You couldn't even get moving money between MTN and, and Vodafone. That couldn't even happen. But once we brought everybody on one platform, you now have interoperability, which is actually expanding the pie for everybody. We had 35 billion in 2015 of mobile money transactions. But this means uh, rather than competing in our individual silos to share 35 billion, we are going to be competing in our individual uh, com com in our individual places to share a trillion Ghana cities, and that is where the collaboration does not contradict competition. We can compete and collaborate at the same time, and it's very very important in this context. And this is also behind our launch of universal QR codes. As you know, you can have QR codes for different institutions, different fintechs, different banks, but if we don't bring everybody into the same platform, the, the, the economies of scale will not be derived. Governor of the Bank of Ghana, Dr. Enes Addison, on his part, spoke on tools that the central bank has invested in to oversee the effective supervision of financial digital services. An online reporting analytics surveillance system, ORAS, has been set up to facilitate submission and improve analysis of prudential and other regulatory returns. A complementary tool that assets granular to analyze for patterns and trends policy intervention board. An additional chat which is an automated consumer complaints management system is also in the office and will help address conduct concerns. The Standard Chartered Digital Banking Innovation and Fintech Festival is being held to provide a platform to showcase Ghana's digital infrastructure and the great strides the country has made on the national digitalization journey. The festival, in collaboration with the Bank of Ghana and the SC Ventures, is under the theme Shaping the Next Phase of Ghana's Financial Technology Landscape for the 21st Century. Cross-border payments in Africa typically involve a third currency, such as the US dollar or euro, leading to high cost and long transaction times. In an effort to improve the situation, the African Export-Import Bank, Avriexim Bank, and the AFCFTA Secretariat announced in September this year the operational rollout of the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System, PAPS, a revolutionary financial market infrastructure to enable instant cross-border payments in local currencies between African markets. PAPS will serve as a continent 
continent-wide platform for the processing, clearing, and settling of intra-African trade and commerce payments leveraging a multilateral net settlement system. Its full implementation is expected to save the continent more than $5 billion in payment transaction costs each year. In his address, as a guest of honor for the Virtual Association of African Central Bank's annual conference on payment systems hosted by the Bank of Ghana under the theme The Role of an Integrated Payment System for Intra-African Trade, Vice President Dr. Mohamed Baumia noted that Africa has been primed by the push for digitalization by COVID to provide the required payment infrastructure and systems to boost trade. As we are aware, the objective of the African Continental Free Trade Area is to promote intra-regional trade and support economic transformation of the continent with access to new markets, increased efficiency, lower production costs, and accelerated growth and development. The achievement of these noble objectives will largely depend on the establishment of a robust payment and settlement system that is secure and guarantees finality of payment. Let me say, distinguished governors, ladies and gentlemen, that with the added impetus for digitalization brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, Africa is now better positioned to provide the required integrated payment infrastructures and such systems to boost trade. It is also important to note that with the anticipated increase in the volume of trade under the AFCFTA, the need for local currency pairings is urgent. Hence the need for an integrated payment system to facilitate easier transactions. Dr. Bahomia, meanwhile, charged central bank governors across Africa to facilitate collaboration amongst key stakeholders to help with the integration of payment systems on the continent. Distinguished governors, in conclusion, let me re-emphasize that stakeholder collaboration is necessary for the smooth operation of an integrated regional payment system. This AACB conference therefore provides the unique platform to strengthen such collaborative efforts to enhance regular engagement on the role of, inter, on the role of African payment systems. As central bank governors, you have the unique task to deliver an integrated payment system infrastructure that boosts inter-African inter trade. I am sure all those assembled here will discuss the issues dispassionately and provide policy guidelines to accelerate the integration of African payment systems and propel intra-African trade for the development of the African continent. In Ghana's information and communication technology industry, there have been palpable developments in the last 15 years, with the country progressively transitioning towards an emerging information technology society. There has been a high rate of mobile penetration and smartphone usage and growth in the e-banking products and services. Many businesses rely on ICT for operations and there is proliferation of online shopping sites and mobile financial services in recent times. This has exposed the country to cybercrime related activities aimed at compromising the confidentiality, integrity and availability of ICT assets. Cyber threats such as hacking, mobile device security threats, data breaches and cyber fraud have become a worry to many companies and the government. In this regard, the coordinator of the Security Governance Initiative, SGI, Osei Bonsu Dixon, is calling on African countries to anchor the introduction of electronic currencies on a well-established cybersecurity firewall to avoid any issues. So if you put 
um, forward any new paradigm for the world, like for example e-currencies. You are fitting it into an environment that itself has a lot of um, challenges in terms of policing, governance and things like that, criminality and all those things. So that implies that the building foundations in the various countries must be solid. You have 16 countries, for example, in ECOWAS. If some of the countries are having challenges in terms of uh, criminalizing certain uh, activities, it's actually in perils other countries. In, in the area of e-commerce, there are certain areas that we are not seeing that happen. So we are beginning to see a lot of the countries, however, respond. And that is why, again, I say that uh, be that as it may, Ghanaian leadership is important. Just as U.S. leadership in the world, I mean, uh, it's in, almost inevitable. Ghanaian leadership and Nigerian leadership in this area is very important. At least our two countries have a very strong approach to cyber matters. In speaking to City News ahead of the CyberX African Conference, Osebonsu noted that cyber law, mobile and digital forensic investigations, and international cooperation will aid effective investigation and prosecution. So at the, at the individual level, it's important that we realize that there are a lot of criminal activity that are pervasive, and therefore your P or your personal information, for example, is something that you should guard jealously. Number two, clicking onto all sorts of links is a little dangerous now. Security Governance Initiative, in partnership with the Center for Strategic and Defense Studies, will on November 9 to 12, 2021, hold a four-day CyberX African Conference in Accra under the auspices of the National Security Ministry. Some participants expected at the conference include the Computer Forensic Institute of Nigeria, Liberia Cyber Crime Prevention and Mitigation Agency, some law firms and investigative bodies. Intra-Africa trade records frequently understate the amount of trade partly because of the lack of adequate statistics and partly because of the high rate of smuggling which allows substantial amounts of traditional border trade to continue unrecorded. Apart from this, commerce between African states has been handicapped by a tendency for trade to remain concentrated within the common currency areas and trade zones that developed among African countries during the colonial era by the often inadequate means of transport and communication and by the limited development of manufacturing industries among others. Speaking during his fact-finding tour to the Volta region, Angolan ambassador to Ghana, His Excellency Jao Domingos Koisa, noted that the existence of the African continental free trade area should be seen as an opportunity to promote trade amongst African states. According to him, although there has been a cordial relationship between African countries, little can be seen when it comes to trade as most Africans are proud to show off goods bought from Europe and Asia. Speaking to City Business News after the meeting, His Excellency Yao Domingos Koisa said African countries need to unite economically and find ways in trading amongst themselves. Big challenge was the political will which has been overtaken. Right now our leaders have agreed we have to find ways of trading among ourselves. Now we're going down to the grassroots. What does the women of who have to sell? Kente, cashew nut, who needs it? It's, it's just a matter of linking ourselves and our peoples. We've found it so easy to go to London and buy clothes. Why can't we buy them from here in Ghana? It's so easy to say, oh, I remember when I went to Milan to buy shoes. I'm sure here in Ghana, shoes are well produced. So it's a question of we telling each other what we have available and we exchanging. It won't be easy, of course, because we're used to other standards, but we have to start somewhere. Africa has to unite, and besides political unity, we need economic unity. That's exactly what Ghana has started with the AFTA, and we are all going to follow. 
In an interview with City Business News, regional head for the Ghana Export Promotion Authority in the Volta and Oti regions, Chris Amponsasaki, said, cost of doing business and the mode of transportation amongst African countries has been a major challenge to business owners in Africa and encouraged leaders to enhance the mode of transportation on the continent to promote sustainable economic activities among African countries. He expressed his satisfaction with the Angolan ambassador's visit and said his outfit, together with the Association of Ghana Industries, will act and put things in action to promote trade amongst African countries. This meeting has been a very great meeting. Um, we have tabled what um, Ghana is able to export to Angola, to the ambassador and his trade officer who was with him. And they have also told us their areas of interest. And so uh, this is just the beginning. The conversation has started. Um, I believe in action and not too much of talking. And so the talking has started today and the action is following. And uh, we at the Ghana Exports Promotion Authority, together with our major stakeholder AGI, we would ensure that we act on all the conversations that we have had here today. As of July this year, data from the Bank of Ghana show that Ghana's total debt stock rose to 336 billion Ghana cities, representing 76.4% of GDP. According to the International Monetary Fund's 2021 Article 5 consultation press release, Ghana remains at high risk of external and overall debt distress under the baseline, even though public debt is assessed as sustainable going forward. The Bretton Woods Institution further projects Ghana's debt-to-GDP ratio to rise to 83.5% by the end of 2021. On the back of these developments, stakeholders have on several occasions called for stringent measures to check the debt situation. Among them is the Economic Governance Platform, a group made up of CSOs and think tanks in the country. A policy analyst, Bernard Anaba, who forms part of the group, believes emphasis should be put on how the country's finances are utilized to enable judicious use of the country's resources to sustain the debt stock in the upcoming budget. In terms of injecting more money, um, already the government is into deficit in terms of uh, financing project development. And that is where most of the, in terms of government financing goes, in terms of building bridges, building roads, construction. That is where a chunk of government money goes. And those infrastructure also help to leverage or support the economy to grow better. So a lot of those areas, we still have problems. Water, uh, making sure that our water systems are better, uh, are in a better shape. Uh, energy, uh, currently we know the issue about energy, making sure that they are financed in a way that is not overly new, uh, 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 in terms of uh, it's not inflated. So all these other sectors are things that where governments spend money, but spend judiciously, will find its way into the economy and will help the economy to grow. And when the economy grows, then you have more money to also refinance your debt. So it's a kind of thing that uh, is linked up. But as I keep saying, what is missing is the judicious use of the finances. Bernard Anaba further expressed hope that the country will record a higher growth rate to ensure better economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The future looks brighter. You know, during the pandemic, the growth rate was down below 2%, thereabout. Uh, but it has tracked up. Now we are expecting about 5% growth. And we were previously doing close between uh, 6 to 7%. So we can get back to that level. And what we are saying is that currently, if you look at the current level of our debt, we are at a deficit of 3.5% uh, of growth. But we may not get that growth in one year. So we can stagger it if we are, do, we are doing additional growth of 1% uh, each year. Over the medium term, we'll be able to retain, return to a very favorable debt sustainable, sustainability levels.
according to the 2021 media budget presentation. Some revisions in government fiscal operations are expected to reduce the fiscal deficit on cash basis to 41.273 billion Ghana cities or 9.4% of GDP down from the original deficit target of 41.298 billion Ghana cities or 9.5% of GDP as stated in the main 2021 budget statement. The deficit is expected to be financed from both foreign and domestic sources. Net foreign financing of the deficit will amount to 15.874 billion Ghana cities, equivalent to 38.5% of total financing, while total domestic financing will amount to 25.399 billion Ghana cities or 61.5% of the total for 2021. In an interview with City Business News ahead of the 2022 budget presentation on Wednesday, November 7th, Economist Courage Marty said he would like to see a faster pace of fiscal consolidation. Um, so, when I pick the 2022 budget, there are two important feelings I want to get from the 2020, 2022 budget. One being that I want to see a faster pace of fiscal consolidation. What I mean by that is I want to see a faster reduction in the gap between spending and revenue because the deficit must be financed by borrowing now if we look at what is happening on the global financial markets in the past few months and what will happen this quarter and into next year probably beyond next year we are likely to see interest rates going up Mr. Marte gives a further breakdown of how development on the international front, especially when it comes to the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, will make borrowing to finance a high fiscal deficit headful for government. Now, again, if a country like Ghana goes onto the market to borrow, there is what we call a credit spread that is charged on top of the U.S. benchmarks. When interest rates were lower, we had a credit spread of between 500 basis points to 600 basis points. Since 22nd September, when the US Fed announced the taper timeline, this credit spread has widened to between 700 basis points to 800 basis points. What that means is that if you go onto the market, the international market to borrow right now, if you add that 800 basis points or 8% to the benchmark of 1.5%, you are hitting over 9.5% for a dollar denominated debt if you are borrowing, if you're a borrower from our part of the world. So in this kind of market, it will be too punitive to continue to run a significantly wide deficit which must be financed from borrowing. That is why when I see the 2022 budget, I want to see a faster compression in the deficit because the financial market is not looking friendly anymore. And into the medium term, it doesn't appear friendly from what we see. The government, as part of its efforts to revive the economy, introduced the COVID-19 health recovery levy, financial sector recovery levy, among others. Some civil society organizations raised concerns over some of these taxes, arguing that they could stifle growth as businesses continue to grapple with the impact of the pandemic. The director of the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ISE, Professor Peter Quote, believes some of the taxes introduced did not live up to expectation with respect to revenue mobilization and should be scrapped. He further advised that if new taxes must be introduced, they must be substituted with the unproductive ones earlier introduced. Professor Peter Quote spoke to the media on the sidelines of the launch of the State of the Ghanaian Economy Report 2020 and review of 2021 third quarter economic performance. That should come if we are replacing it with something. I mean, when new taxes were introduced, there's a need to evaluate those new taxes and those that are not performing or what somebody or what we would term nuisance taxes, you take them out. 
then you can replace them with something else but if we add more uh, there can be uh, too much stress on the private sector on individuals and that could lead to tax avoidance and tax evasion well we can't say that they are not needed they are needed. the government needs the revenue we enjoy the freebies so it has to be paid for but what i'm saying is some are not yielding the needed revenue so like the sanitation levy for instance the last uh, the quarter two 2021 figures show that they are not using much it is the uh, covid 19 levy health levy as well as the financial sector levy that is raking in the revenue but sanitation levy for instance is not bringing in much so a review of these taxes to see whether they are being efficient or we are rather spending more money uh, collecting this little revenue you scrap them and replace them with something that will bring in more revenue to the system. Meanwhile, Professor Peter Quarte also indicated that he expected the country to make significant gains in its revenue generation for this year. Last year, the Ghana Revenue Authority met its targets for the year, even though the figure was reduced downwards in the mid-year budget review due to the impact of the pandemic. We expect the revenue numbers to be better than we are seeing now. Uh, with the uh, talk about the digitization and other means, we want to see more revenue being generated. We want to see higher focus revenue mobilization um, and also prudent management of uh, resources. If that is done, uh, certainly we will be relying less on borrowing. So we want to see conscious efforts to reduce our debt, our high debt GDP ratio to sustainable levels in the medium term. By 2024, I think we should be back to sustainable levels. I expect our revenue numbers to increase and to increase even further in 2022 because that is the only way by which we can gradually move away from borrowing and use domestic resources to develop the country. Ahead of the presentation of the 2022 budget, the Ghana Union of Traders Association's GUTA says it expects the 50% reduction in benchmark values to remain untouched. GUTA had earlier cautioned the government against any attempt to reverse the reduction following attempts by the Association of Ghana Industries AGI to get it cancelled. AGI had argued that the reduction in benchmark values was making local producers uncompetitive as it made imported goods cheaper. The government introduced a discount to encourage tax compliance and to increase its revenue. President of Guta, Dr. Joseph Obing, says the government must maintain the status quo to protect its inflows. This is not the time for anybody to think about reversing the benchmark value, which has been um, the mitigating factor for businesses otherwise most businesses would have collapsed by now and so we are not expecting um if government want this uh, to enhance on revenue um there are so many loopholes that have already enumerated government can look at those areas the areas of um, a tax exemption they can look at that a areas like um, warehousing the areas are free zone and all that there are a lot of abuses Government should plug these uh, loopholes. The transshipment of goods into the landlocked areas are all areas that people use to uh, avoid tax payment and all that. And if government can um, actually um, um, plug these uh, loopholes, it will enhance on the revenue collection. And then also, not worrying is again because businesses have started showing um, a fatigue in tax payment and um, we, we are not prepared any longer to absorb any layer of additional layer of course into the way of doing business i've already told you the issues at the port ports um, um levies and, and taxes have gone up astronomically because the shipping lines are extorting um, um, um so uh, unnecessary fees from us and all that 
where commodity prices have gone up. Meanwhile, the Traders Advocacy Group Ghana TAG is calling on the government to address the issue of high cost of lending in the country. Our expectation in the 2022 budget, we want a situation whereby the government, bearing in mind that we have uh, after here, and we will be trading among our neighboring uh, countries, of which some of them have about 12% interest rate when they take facility from the banks. When it comes to our country, Ghana, it hovers around 20 to 25%. And we are going to compete with these people who are taking 6%, 8%, and 12%. So we want to encourage the finance minister, as a matter of agency, to at least find something for a Ghanaian trader that the interest rates will come down. If you are like doing like 15 14%, in as much as it is high, but it's better than what we are having now and uh, one thing that we will expect the finance minister to say i think the finance minister should charge the bank of ghana governor to crack the waves the bank of ghana they have to get out from their comfort zone it's not just you come you announce the po policy rate you are ca you come you announce the lending rate no when after announcing it, I think there, there are a lot of things that you can do. Over the years, Ghana has lost a lot of money due to the lack of proper revenue collection systems. For instance, the Ghana Revenue Authority witnessed a 212 million CD shortfall in tax revenue in the first half of 2021. The authority collected 25.89 billion CDs in tax revenue as against 26.1 billion CDs targeted for the period. Though government recently set up the Revenue Assurance and Compliance Enforcement Race Initiative to help the country achieve its revenue mobilization target, stakeholders have called on government to do more, to rake in more taxes, identify and eliminate revenue leakages, reinforce the culture of compliance, and increase the revenue to GDP ratio in the country. Speaking at the Graphic Business Tambic Bank breakfast meeting in Accra, Minister of State at the Ministry of Finance, Charles Edubwine hinted that governments will use the 2022 budget to introduce more policies and strategies to raise revenue and widen the tax net. This budget is focused on expenditure rationalization and optimizing the implementation of flagship and strategic programs, widening and deepening existing revenue sources, including expanding the tax net um, due to the elevated debt levels in 2020. We saw our fiscal space continue to be eaten up by high interest expense. Um, if you look at how much of our revenue we're using to service our debt, it is clear that we need to look at how we can reduce the cost of borrowing. Alongside that, given the fact that we have such high de de debt levels, we have to focus on revenue maximization. And we still really do not believe that we are maximizing our revenue potential. I think uh, uh, tax revenues as a percentage of GDP is under 14%, between 13 to 14%. Uh, most countries, even some of our peers in Africa, is closer to 18 or 19%. So clearly, there's a lot of room for growth. He also noted that Cabinet is deliberating on the final drafts of the tax exemption bill as government pushes for it to be laid in Parliament before the end of this year. According to him, the bill, which is long overdue, when passed into law, would help government streamline tax exemptions for businesses and foreign investors in the country. I totally agree. I mean, we've been talking about this exemptions bill from 2017, 2018, and in fact, we just submitted a draft to cabinet. We, well, the plan is to try and get it laid before parliament before we uh, submit the budget. 
Uh, I think we have a meeting tomorrow to finalize that and get it laid. But the objective is not to enter 2022 without the exemptions bill laid. Fuel prices started the year a little over 4 Ghana cities per litre, but currently they are just 20 pesos shy of hitting 7 cities a litre. The levy was introduced in 2015 to serve as a buffer for under-recoveries in the petroleum sector and to stabilise petroleum prices for consumers, among others. The National Petroleum Authority had last month announced a two-month suspension of the levy, which currently stands at 16 pesos per litre on petrol, 14 pesos per litre on diesel, and 14 pesos per kilogram on LPG. Some civil society organisations, like the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEC, have called for the scrapping of the levy, arguing that it has outlived its purpose. Former board chairman of the Association of Oil Marketing Companies, Henry Akwabwa, has been speaking on the levy. There's this component called the price stabilization that the government, I think, it, for this window, has decided to waive. I think this is even temporary. I think that all the revenue that has accrued since the price stabilization was imposed should not be used to reduce the prices on, on I mean to reduce the, the prices. I mean that is that is the reason why that levy was imposed in any way. So the time has come for us to use it. I don't know how much is sitting in there, but let the government disclose it and say this is how much we we were able to uh, accrue uh, and this is how we are going to implement it. So in a way, for this period where we expect prices to be going up, that is the only thing the government can do uh, to either stabilize it or further reduce it. You know, so two things they need to do. Look at the, look at the taxes and also see how you can use the, uh, the, the stabilization fund. Meanwhile, the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers, COPEX, says the prices of petroleum products are likely to go up again despite moves to scrap the price stabilization and recovery levy. Uh, MPA had given the indication that they were reducing the stabilization and recovery levy. And so they had even added that to the pricing that came for the last window, October. So if you recall, the Association of Oil Marketing Companies had come out to say Fuel prices were likely, um, diesel was likely to be about 7.08, uh, petrol could go to 7.11, but most of them came up with 6.80, nobody even got to the 6.9. Uh, what they explain is that some of them had even factored in that 16 peso uh, reduction during that window. So it is quite a difficult turf for them at this point to go and reduce uh, fuel prices, especially when world market prices has also gone up and the city's depreciation uh, has further worsened or compounded the situation for them. Golden Star Resources Limited operates the Wasa Gold Mine in Ghana, which is a large-scale non-refractory underground gold mine. The company is currently listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the Toronto Stock Exchange, and the Ghana Stock Exchange.
A statement released by the Ghanaian company said Shifeng has agreed to acquire all of the issued and outstanding common shares of Golden Star by way of a statutory plan of arrangement. Golden Star shareholders are thus expected to receive $3.91 per share as part of the deal. The transaction will be subject to the approval of a little over 66% of the votes cast by Golden Star shareholders at the special meeting of shareholders. The Golden Star shareholder meeting is expected to be held prior to the end of the year. The transaction may also be subject to the approval of a little over 66% of the votes cast by shareholders of Shifeng at the Shifeng shareholder meeting. The Shifeng shareholder meeting, if applicable, is expected to be held prior to the end of the year. Gerard Boachi is the corporate affairs manager of Golden Star and he has been sharing more details about the deal with City Business News. So just, just like in the life of any listed company, um, in our economic jurisdiction, there are opportunities and offers for takeovers, mergers, and acquisitions. Um, yesterday, Golding Star announced a major acquisition of Golding Star's WASA operation, or mine, so to speak, and the value was $470 million. That, in effect, says that all the shares will be paid for by the new controller, and our liabilities in terms of what we owe the banks would also be paid. That's about $90 million. So this acquisition is, um, is of a value of about $560 million. And that was the major announcement that the, the board um, of Golden Star announced yesterday. Um, it does not mean that they just woke up and decided. Obviously, there has been discussions that have gone on um, in the last couple of months, but you and I wouldn't have known because as a listed company, we will have to keep it confidential to avoid any criminal um, um, offenses by means of insider trading and making known our intentions. Then at the time that we're satisfied with the offers that we're receiving or satisfied with one offer that we're receiving, then it's announced. So that's what happened yesterday. Mr. Boachi further explains what will happen to employees in light of the ongoing negotiations. Yes, fully. Their jobs will be secured unless you don't want to be employed. But also another introduction which has um, been made in this one is that because there's a changing controller and from the past experiences and um, 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 messages that we've been receiving, there will be severance paid to to all employees and then we we'll take opportunity or advantage of the process to harmonize contracts as, as we exist now. They are permanent staff, fixed term contract, contractors. So, so going forward, um, just to harmonize the contracts, we we'll use that period also as well to sort of harmonize the contracts. But initially, we have been told and, and uh, that the agreement takes care of payment of severance outrightly to all permanent staff or all staff that deserve are uh, entitled to it. The Kwadasu College of Agriculture started in 1992 and was subsequently used to train staff of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. It is now a tertiary institution that runs diploma programs and related agricultural courses. The ministry says processes have begun to upgrade the facility into a full agri-university. But we at the uh, Ministry of Food and Agriculture have also taken a... Uh, uh, thought of something, and that is to upgrade it to a university of agriculture. So what we are doing now, currently we have uh, signed an MOU with University of Mendel in the Czech Republic. The MOU is just to help you um, collaborate with the university. They have, because they already have a model, so to see, to assist us to establish a similar model. So you know agriculture is not 
just about one particular area. It cuts across the value chain. So we want to establish campuses across the country. And Kwanda will be the center. We are likely to have one at Ejura, another one at Winchi. So we'll do so much in terms of agriculture. We have taken that decision because we have seen that agriculture has evolved over the years. And that is the solution to the economic problems of this country. That is one area that we can use to solve the unemployment situation in this country. So that is the decision for now. The Kwadasu College of Agriculture, since its 100 years of establishment, is bedeviled with challenges including inadequate infrastructure. The principal of the college spoke about how these challenges are affecting academic activities. The increase in student population has stretched our limited facilities to an unbearable point. We find it very difficult to accommodate all our qualified students. We also find it very difficult to find enough classroom space. We need the assistance of all and sundry. Students of the college appealed to government to restore allowances paid to them and also post them after completion. The Agri Ministry has been responding to some concerns raised by the students. Yes. For allowance, as you know, allowance were cancelled way back. What we have done is to lease with the GET Fund to support students with student loan, as they are doing for some statutory institutions. So that is what is going on. So as we speak now, GET Fund, not GET Fund, sorry, the Student Loans Trust is helping the diploma student with some loans to help them to complete their course. Yeah, posting, as you know, in fact, we have realized that it is difficult for government to absorb all of them. So what we have done is to revise the curricula. So now what we have is that it's a curricula that is entrepreneurship oriented or agribusiness oriented. So as a student, when you pass out from the campus, you, you are trained to start something new. The centenary celebration is on the theme Kwadasu Agricultural College, 100 years of agricultural education in Ghana. The Bui Power Authority is running 12 business models under the Livelihood Enhancement Program to empower persons affected by the construction of the dam. The company has so far spent 3,547,556 Ghana cities on the models with 409 persons out of the 815 being helped to establish and operate their own businesses. 170 persons have been trained in fish farming and have been handed over their fish ponds to start operating. Two of the beneficiaries have been speaking to City Business News. The uh, the Asida Kesebema Bui Power Authority. So my ponds we are my. Yeah, yeah, the bia. Yes, we are. So we are my. In fact, the bia. Ah, yeah, yeah, livelihood. Now, I'm um fish pond with the. Yeah, any bida. And in the. Afena yeshi asie na enimu se eya ade a nkrofo aye pen a edi mfaso abrom enti na mo abeye maye nu be yeye de eya de fufro ye honum enti ye be sire se company nu ni ye omun sabe hiem tem bia na ya nya sustainability a e wo livelihood omun se omudi be maye nu na atimi anya sustainability e wo ade we mu because ye mu bebre anye bida enti se omun ni ye anko anye ma um faso bia frimo aba eh na kire se eh emboa na mum mi bompa e se ebetumi aboa ye ni omu nyina ye wo me ma binu mu a ye hia wo fish pond be bi ha se e bi e ye constant electricity because ade a wo hu ni ne e wo ha nyina no e ye electricity ene ye di twinsu no a pond su no etimi rani 
let go off to see our bones say in Sonu, Nesha say a she pumps noon, and ye juma, and I'm one more Bahai, Yanimwa, and we are one agina, a fish be brebe way, and Susunu, I was say, O be in the fisher, say be a emergency BC, no be in the fisher, and cause on your story facility be preservation, baby, all the Adinibagua, Adinun say, no at my cotton, but more by someone who then be our ha, and to Yen we and my beer, ye be so moon. So bet me a boyen. No ma won my dear brain, ye near jihu, and so a tumbre bea na no namunu e wube bre nti yes rawn mse yemba boy na no ma e be ye ya namunu and se my the board chairman of the BPA, Kwesia Maya Chame, and the company of the chief executive officer of We Power Authority, Kufija Messi, said the authority will continue to help resettlement communities. To enhance their livelihoods. But coming here today, we've seen the practical aspect of it, where fish ponds have been handed over to beneficiaries, and we've come to this place where bags are made, poultry is ongoing, and it's wonderful. I think that we can do more to support the people and the communities so that they can have a life to themselves. Thank you.